You're all well, very welcome to this webinar. My name is, is Jens Sorensen, and I'm the director of the Healthcare Outcome Research Center here at RCSI, and I'm a professor of health economics. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. This is a first in a planned series of four sessions during this year. This is our second webinar series. Some of you might have taken part in the series last year that focused on the value-based healthcare. We have called this year's seminar series, The Future of Healthcare in Ireland, Health Economic Perspectives. The global burden of disease collaboration has estimated that in 2019, there were 24 million new cases of cancer and 10 million deaths related to cancer globally. This equates to a loss of 250 million disability adjusted life years due to cancer. Only cardiovascular diseases contribute more to death and loss in Dallas than cancer. This global burden is expected to increase over the next decade. More than 40% of cancer death and loss Dallas are related to lifestyle risk factors that may be preventable. Despite the opportunity, the last decade has seen a 15 to 20 percent increase in risk factor attributable cancer, death and disability adjusted life years. In Ireland, there are more than 40,000 new cases of cancer each year and nearly 10,000 people die from cancer. Cancer accounts for around 30 percent of all deaths in Ireland. A cancer diagnosis has severe impact on people's life. It has consequences for their health, social well-being and well, and it often reduces their quality of life and survival time, as well as creating worries and concerns for their families and their relatives. There is a substantial healthcare industry that provides prevention, treatment and rehabilitation to patients, and a research industry that tries to develop new and more effective ways of preventing, treating and caring for patients and their relatives. The public and private investment in cancer is huge. The hope is that this investment will reduce the risk of cancer, improve the life of patients, and reduce the individual and social cost related to cancer. A European study has estimated that cancer costs the European Health Service more than 125 billion dollars euros each year and a similar amount is lost in productivity. The study has estimated that the healthcare cost in Ireland was 600 million or 40% of the total healthcare expenditures. 80% of these costs were medical care and 20% related to drugs. The study further showed that Ireland spent more on cancer healthcare than many other European countries. Only Luxembourg, Germany, Austria and Finland had higher spending per resident. The level of investment in cancer is therefore important for people's life, for the healthcare and research industry, as well as for the taxpayers and health insurance industry. There are many interests to consider when debating the investment in, in cancer care, in this webinar series, we will consider some of the health economic perspectives. In today's seminar, the theme is achieving better outcomes for patients and improving value. We have invited three speakers to share their take on the theme. I will take, thank the speakers for the time and willingness to take part in this webinar. I will also thank the organizing group that consists of Mark Cavanan, David Dunn from Janssen's Pharmaceuticals, Bridget Cunningham from Novartis, and my colleagues, uh, Brian Lynch, Laura Hammond, and Kathleen Bennett from the RCSI. Also, thanks to the companies for the support of this webinar series. We are also grateful to Ronan Glynn, the sector lead from EY Island. Ronan was the deputy chief medical officer at the Department of Health. And I'm sure many of you will have met Ronan uh, in his role as spokesperson during the COVID pandemic. 
Ronan has agreed to take on the role as moderator of this webinar series. Before I hand over to Ronan, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the participants for taking part. We are very pleased to see such a large interest in the webinar. You may also want to know that next webinar will take place Thursday the 18th of May at the same time. We hope to see you there again. I also want to remind you that the next Healthcare Outcome Conference is taking place at RCSI on Tuesday the 25th of April. The theme this year is Healthcare Policy, Balancing the Good and the Bad. You can see more information about this conference at the RCSI webpage, and we hope to see you there. Be there. After these opening comments, I will now hand you over to our moderator, Ronan Glenn. Ronan, the podium, podium is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan, and good afternoon, everybody. You're welcome to the webinar today. Uh, it's it's an interesting topic, and I think one that will resonate with all of us for a variety of different reasons, both professional and, and personal, of course. Um, we have three speakers this morning, uh, Professor Deirdre Murray, from the, who's the director of the National Cancer Registry, Dr. Thomas Hofmarscher, who's a health economist with the Swedish Institute of Health Economics, and Rachel Morrow, who's the director of advocacy and external affairs at the Irish Cancer Society. Um, as, as Jan said, we, we, we have come a long way in relation to how we approach and manage cancer in this country over the last couple of decades. We've seen a 50% increase in survivorship over the past decade alone, uh, which is fantastic, but we have a long way to go. We still see 10,000 deaths a year uh, and about one in three deaths every year in Ireland is as a result of cancer. And of course, even amongst the group is here today, what we know is that about one in two of us on this webinar and one in two people in the population generally will develop a cancer at some stage over their lifetime. So a very important topic, as I said, both from a, a, a professional, but also from a personal perspective. So with that, I might uh, begin. As I said, we have three speakers. Each will, uh, each will take us through a presentation of approximately 20 minutes each. And then we'll, we'll after the three presentations have been given, we will do a Q&A for approximately another 20 minutes and we'll hope to finish up by 1.30. So I might start with the first presentation this morning. It's from Professor Deirdre Murray. Deirdre joined the National Cancer Registry as director in 2021. She's a medical graduate of UCC, has a master's in public health from UCD and is a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health Medicine. Deirdre has, worked, has almost two decades of experience as a specialist in public health medicine. She's worked in the HSE's National Cancer Control Programme since its inception, is a founding member of its executive management team, and she established and led the NCCP's cancer intelligence function. She's a trainer with the Faculty of Public Health Medicine and has a particular interest in health information and health services research, delivering research presentations to students at UCC and to national and international conferences. Deirdre, thank you very much. Thanks, Ronan. Okay, so let's see if we can get this right. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, it's perfect. Thanks, Deirdre. That's right, right. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. And as Ronan said, um, my name is Deirdre Murray and I'm the director of the Cancer Registry in Ireland. And I suppose today what I want to do is to paint a picture um, as to where we are in relation to the epidemiology of cancer in Ireland and where we've come from and maybe to put some of of um, of where we are in a European context to, to add to the debate uh, for this very important topic that we have today. And I also want to thank, of course, the RCSI and Professor Sorensen for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. So cancer policy in Ireland goes back to the mid 1990s with our first cancer strategy um, and that focused on themes that are really uh, familiar to us all today, even those of us who've been involved now 15 years later, it looked at access, specialisation, the quality of services, and then also looked at prevention, early detection, coordination, research and um, education. And following the strategy, there was an evaluation done uh, independently, which pointed out that although there had been significant progress, there was an absence of a fully coordinated um, approach to many aspects of the cancer pathway, starting indeed with the prevention side of things. So uh, right through there, there was coordination was lacking. So the second cancer strategy, which was published in 2006, really set out 
the um, formation of what we now know as the National Cancer Control Programme. Um, and that had a, a similar, a similar um, suite of objectives. Again, centralisation would have been a major theme. There was a, a, a report on the implementation published by the Cancer Control Programme itself and then an international um, external evaluation report, which again showed a lot of progress to date, but highlighted um, some outstanding issues, particularly the importance of, of developing a cancer survivorship programme and a hereditary cancer programme, both of which would have featured in our now blueprint for cancer control, which would be the, the National Cancer Strategy. So where are we now? Well, as both Jan and Ronan would have said, we have over 43,000 tumours registered every year um, and about 56,000 of those are what we would call invasive or potentially life changing. 56% of those are potentially life changing tumours, which is about 25, over 25,000 a year. We get about just on 12,000 non-melanoma skin can cancers are diagnosed and notified to the registry. And then there are just under 8% of other tumours, which would include benign breast tumours, which are benign brain tumours, which obviously can also kill, um, and other, um, other tumours like in situ carcinomas or tumours of uncertain behaviour. Uh, but I suppose our focus, particularly really uh, from the cancer perspective, is on those invasive life-changing cancers. And when we look at those uh, and our most recent data is looking now at 2018 to 2020, uh, four big cancers come forward and that would be common to all developed countries really. Um, breast, prostate, colorectal and lung comprise over half of all of those tumours. And when we look at cancer deaths, um, the same big four uh, appear um, in a different order, but uh, the deaths which are notified to us and uh, we, we get that data from the Central Statistics Office for which we're very grateful of those same four, big four make up 45 percent of all cancer deaths. So as part of this I kind of look back at some of our our old registry reports and if you look at one of our reports back uh, towards the beginning of when the cancer registry began and and looking at at cancer incidents and deaths in 1994 to 1998 we see, you know, some, some, some familiar um, cancers there. Again, it's breast, lung, prostate and colorectal. So I suppose the question that we have to ask ourselves was, is really what has changed in, in the meantime? And if we're going to look at what a cancer control programme does um, and how well cancer is controlled in a particular country, we need to look at three different in indices. We looked at, at cancer survival, uh, which, which Rona would have mentioned. So how, how well are, cancer, are people living? beyond their cancer diagnosis, cancer incidence, so how many new cases of cancer do we have diagnosed every year, and then cancer deaths or cancer mortality. And we need the incidence and deaths to be on the decrease and cancer survival to be increasing to consider that we have any particular cancer tumour site under control. So I'm going to look at those parameters over the last three decades, particularly looking obviously at mostly at our own data, um, from the NCRI, but also looking at some data from the national, from the European Cancer Information System, and also drawing on a, a recent um, publication from the European Cancer Inequalities Registry, which was done by the OECD, uh, just published last month, uh, looking at a cancer, our cancer profile of Ireland, and that helps to put our statistics in a European perspective. So if we look at all cancers since the registry began collecting data back in 94, uh, we can see that the incidence rate was on the increase up until 2010 and has then begun to flatten out. Uh, whereas cancer deaths um, were, have been decreasing by 1.4% per year since the registry began its data collection. But that is not the same uh, for both of the sexes. So if we look at females, females had a very flat picture in terms of cancer incidence since 1994 um, and has this has begun to increase since 2008 and that increase really is driven by the increase in breast cancer cases. Mortality uh, is, is reducing as we said uh, by 1.1 percent per year and for, for cancer in males it has a different picture in that we saw a year-on-year -year increase up until 2010 for men which has been dropping since 2010 by just 0.7 percent per year. Again, that fall is partly due to a fall in, in uh, diagnosis of prostate cancer because we had some very rapid accelerating uh, rates 
as PSA was was rolled out with it throughout the country. Um, and obviously the reduction in lung cancer, which is 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 very welcome and great to see. And that that is also impacting on the cancer incidence and from cancer mortality or deaths in males. Again, that has been reducing since the registry began in 1994. So looking back in 2006 at, at, at from a European level, and this is kind of, uh, as we know, Europe, Europe has kind of changed, changes countries uh, uh, every so often. So all of these are um, and they're not always directly comparable, but um, Ireland would have been a, the, the third highest in terms of cancers for, for deaths, uh, in cancer incidence for uh, men and the fourth highest in cancer incidence for women. So Hungary had the, the highest incidence overall back there and Malta had the lowest incidence and we were well up the league table. If we look at us now in 2020, and this is an estimate which would have been done by the OECD, um, we are second highest for both tumours, for both, both sexes, or second highest in Europe for men and second highest in, for Europe in women. And if you look at that in terms of, of the relativity, that puts us to the top of the European table in cancer incidence. So we have a 26.3% higher incidence of cancer than the European average. Then looking at cancer deaths in 2020, um, we, uh, Ireland's above the European average for females, but below the European average for males. So again, we see a difference between, between the sexes. We have the fifth highest cancer mortality for women um, and the 17th highest for males. Uh, so then when we put all of that together, that puts us at about 10.7 or nearly 11% above the European average for cancer deaths. That's estimated in 2020. Now, the uh, European uh, Cancer Inequalities Registry that I mentioned, that cancer profile, looked at deaths. Well, these would be absolute deaths in 2019, and they came to the same conclusion as the estimates in 2020, saying they were higher than the EU average. But if you look at that, um, we can see uh, compared to our European neighbours, uh, the fall in cancer deaths in 2011 was third fastest in Europe. So we had a 14% reduction in males and a 13% reduction in females. So although we're still above the EU average and need to, we're, we're looking to improve that, we have had the, you know, a very, very, very fast imp improvements there. Only Malta and Luxembourg uh, were ahead of us in terms of uh, improving the mortality rates. So we, we something to look at there. And then cancer survivorship. Um, as you know, our most recent report, uh, last two reports have looked at cancer survivorship and we're now at 65% overall for all cancer types, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and that has come up from a, a low of, let's say, 42% when the registry would have begun. Um, but unfortunately, I suppose that improvement is not uniform across all cancer types. So, um, you know, it can range from 14% cancer five year survival from pancreatic cancer to a 96% in, in testicular cancer. So this is a huge range. And then even in looking on, at the cancer improvements, we can see that multiple myeloma um, has improved most in the times in, over that time period with a 37% improvement. And indeed, um, a lot of the blood cancers are in that top five there. Um, whereas other cancers such as uh, brain and laryngeal have had less than 10% improvement in the time. However, even in the high fatality cancers, as we call the cancers that, that are really the killing cancers, um, there has been a doubling of survival over the period. So, so esophageal has gone from 11 to 24%, pancreas from 5% to 14%. Its liver and lung equally have increased um, substantially. So that is all um, positive news really for, for cancer patients. And looking at where we are in terms of survival with our European neighbours, a number of studies have been done, the Euro, known as the Eurocare studies, over the last uh, decades and Eurocare 4 would have looked at cancers uh, for patients diagnosed in 94 to 99. <clears throat> and in that situation, Ireland was really in the doldrums. We had, were 6% below the European average in terms of survival and we were 13% uh, below the best performing country, which was Sweden. In 2000, uh, 2007, uh, they report, Eurocare reported again, and here we could see that Ireland, this is after, I'd say, our first cancer strategy, we had jumped up in terms of the league tables of survival. So we were now just under the European 
um, average rate, but still we were 11% below the best performing countries. Unfortunately, Eurocare 6, which is due to be um, look at 2010 to 2014, uh, hasn't reported for adults yet, but looking, um, there are other sources of it and, and one, one of the other international collaborations look at the same thing. And one of the ones that Ireland is involved in is the International Cancer Benchmarking Partnership. Now, this is a group that was set up about 10 years ago to look at international variation in inc incidence, mortality and survival amongst countries um, outside of Europe. It's not just Europe, but they have a similar wealth uh, profile, all countries and a similar um, expenditure in terms of healthcare, as well as having a fairly similar healthcare system. And when we look at that, uh, at that, their publications from this collaboration, the so-called Servmark study, which was done and published in 2019, has shown, um, you know, some good news for, for Ireland. So across the seven countries that were included, survival figures were the second highest for esophageal, third highest for, for stomach cancers, fourth highest for lung cancer. Um, but we were uh, second lowest for colorectal and we were lowest for ovarian cancer. And then if you looked at it again in terms of improvements, we were the highest improvements of the seven, best improved in the seven for esophageal and stomach uh, second highest for rectal and lung, and third highest for colon cancer. All of these would have been cancers that the cancer control program would have um, targeted in terms of its centralisation. So this particular publication was really uh, was, was re really important for um, feedback on how the policy and the policy implementation had actually ruled out what it, what it meant in terms of, of, of life saved uh, in Ireland. There has been um, other countries that have, have other, other international collaborations have done similar things. So Concord, which would be, it's a global, uh, global collaboration that's led by Michelle Coleman in London, and that looks at, at cancer incidence and survival all over the world. Um, and again, the, the OECD folk have looked at uh, at Ireland and seeing that our survival rates outperform most EU averages. This is again for 2010 to 2014. And as we know, our survival rates come up again for 2014 to 2018. So um, although we don't have definitive, a nice Eurocare study to look at it, it does look like that we're moving in the right direction. So I suppose, what did Ireland put in place? Well, we did put in place uh, after the second cancer control programme and national cancer uh, after the second strategy and national cancer control program and that basically was establishing at the time four cancer networks which were aligned with what were then the HSE areas um, which was kind of a million population each and then two adult cancer centres in each of those um, area populations. Now since then of course we have the ninth paediatric centre and um, Letterkenny is also included there as, as, as a, a, a satellite of Galway. Um, and of course, the, the, the areas have changed or uh, changing, but this really put in place a, a method to, to deliver services in a coordinated way. And I suppose what the Cancer Control Programme have been doing is developing pathways, guidelines um, and uh, mechanisms by the cancer for the cancer community to work together, um, as well as enhancing and um, adding to the staffing and specialisation in the various cancer centres. And one element of which uh, of cancer work, which has been, you know, as I said, it, it's gone across uh, the whole pathway that, the, you know, there, there's been work done on the whole pathway. But one aspect that the NCRI have looked at is the centralization of services. And again, a report that we would have done in 2019 showed that, A, first of all, there was evidence of centralization in the adult centers and that if you tender there, you're more likely to receive oncological treatment, which would not necessarily be a surprise, but I suppose that you also had higher or better survival outcomes, which is certainly what everybody is seeking for. So I suppose in conclusion, what I would say is that there is significant progress, there's evidence of significant progress in cancer control, uh, certainly up to the end of 2019. I've stayed away from the 2020, as we know, um, that that began with COVID, uh, the COVID case, COVID uh, pandemic, which is, has changed everything, um, all services, including cancer services, and we'll have to look at the impact of that over the next number of years. But um, we certainly had improvements, uh, improvements up to there with survival, uh, as I said, across all of the tumour sites showing some improvements and some massive improvements in comparison to the others. 
and then our incidence was generally static or in decline and mortality rates continuing in decline. And really, I suppose we could see that these improvements were at a faster rate than many of our European counterparts, which is, I suppose, what we were looking for in terms of the investment that has been in, in the cancer services. But there is obviously uh, always more work to be done, um, more work to be done in uh, outside of the acute care for, for cancer, for, for cancer um, patients and, of course, work to be done to match what are indeed still the best performing countries in Europe and the world. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Professor Murray. Thank you very much. It's great and keeping on time. Uh, just a reminder before I introduce our next speaker uh, that if you have questions, please put them into the chat and we'll do our best to cover at least some of them in the, in the Q&A at, at the end of the session. Uh, so now I want to introduce our second speaker today, who's Dr. Thomas Hofmarcher. He, Thomas holds a PhD in economics from Lund University, and he's currently working as a health economist at the Swedish Institute for Health Economics. An expert in cancer policy, his work revolves around the economic burden of cancer, emphasising the wider societal consequences over and above just healthcare spending. He's an expert in conducting comparative analysis of health systems and cancer policies around the world, and he's led ma several major international projects on cancer care in Europe, the Asia Pacific, uh, and in the Middle East and Africa. He's advised the European Commission and the OECD in their work with Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. So, Thomas. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. Uh, let me share my slides. So you should be able to see them in just a second from now. So I hope you can see them now. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you uh, today. So my name is Thomas Hofmacher. I'm a health economist and research director at the Swedish Institute for Health Economics. Uh, and I want to thank the, the organizers and Professor Jan Sørensen for, for, for this invitation opportunity to, to speak. Um, so I have the honor really to present some key findings of a report that we published uh, at the end of last year. Uh, the report, you see a picture of the title page to the right, is called Comparative Report on Cancer in Ireland, Disease Burden, Costs and Access to Medicines, where we looked at the cancer situation in Ireland and then compared Ireland to the old EU15 countries, which we thought is a, is a nice group of uh, countries that is fairly comparable to, to, to Ireland, uh, so leaving out the Eastern European countries that joined the EU in 2004 and uh, following years. Um, and let me start my presentation by actually just going through some findings that you just uh, have seen in, in Deirdre's uh, presentation, um, because what we what we did in the report is we talked uh, uh, we looked at a lot of statistics, uh, epidemiological statistics, where we relied on uh, the National Cancer Registry in Ireland, which is a fantastic registry uh, that you have in place. Um, but let me start with some, some key statistics. Uh, the first key statistics uh, when it comes to cancer, uh, in order to characterize this, the current situation, the current burden of cancer to society, is to look at what's cancer's place in the ranking of leading causes of death and if we look at the ranking in, in Ireland, then back in the year 2000, 24% of deaths were caused by cancer. Uh, and that share has grown over time up until 2019, where 29% of deaths were caused by cancer. Uh, and over that time, really, cancer became the leading cause of death because cardiovascular diseases, so this blue part of the, of the circle diagram, uh, decreased a lot from 40 to 27%. So cancer actually overtook cardiovascular diseases during the past two decades and is now the leading cause of cancer death in Ireland. In the EU15, uh, we saw a similar development, cardiovascular diseases uh, going down a lot, so mortality in those have uh, decreased a lot, uh, whereas the share of cancer deaths has uh, expanded just as in, in Ireland, not as much as in Ireland, but it has expanded and it's in Europe in, or in the EU15, it's still the second leading cause of death, but it's very close now to cardiovascular diseases and it's probably just a matter of uh, five years or so until cancer is unfortunately the leading cause 
of death uh, even in the EU15. Um, and uh, the other key statistics uh, that I would look at uh, to start with is the number of new cancer cases and how have they developed. Uh, what you see here on, on, on the picture is cancer incidence, so the number of new cases in Ireland, and you just heard from the Adrid that they have been increasing over the years. Back in 1995, there were around 12,000 people diagnosed with, with cancer in Ireland, and that number has grown to over 24,000. You you've just seen that uh, until, uh, until 2019, and that's again um, can the in invasive cancer cases excluding non uh, non melanoma skin cancer? So I'm just looking at, at that group of of cancer types in my uh, in my presentation. So it has essentially doubled from 12 to 24 thousand over the course of of 25 years. Uh, that's a that's a steep increase. If we look at the increase per capita. Uh, it's a little bit less steep. It's uh, almost a 50% increase over that period of time, but it's still a, a, a huge increase. And that's caused uh, by population aging mostly. Also some development, uh, uh, unfavorable development in some risk factors that contributes to the increase, but it's really population aging that is driving the massive increase in new cancer cases that we see in, in, in Ireland. Um, and um, cancer incidence is one thing. If we at the same time also look at cancer mortality, so how cancer deaths have developed during this exact same period from 1995 to 2019, you see that uh, um, the overall uh, numbers on mortality, so the solid lines, uh, still have increased a little bit over time from around um, 7,000 deaths to almost 10,000 deaths now. But uh, when it comes to per capita numbers, actually cancer mortality has been has been decreasing uh, slightly over time. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is, is a bit different from what Deirdre has shown you, because uh, she shows you age standardized rates. I'm showing you crude rates. So I'm just taking the number of deaths divided by the population to show you cases or deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Age standardized rates that you saw before uh, are a bit different because they do away with um, the, if, the, the effect of population aging, which heavily impacts uh, all of these numbers. But you know, for policymakers um, that have to deal with uh, where should we uh, increase our capacity to take care really of the increasing number of cancer patients, it's it's a bit more relevant also to to not forget about the fact that. Well, population is happening, so we should look at the crude rates uh, as well uh, uh, in order to take into account that there are actually more and more patients. Uh, so uh, the progress that we see is more of a hypothetical scenario, like if population aging didn't happen, then maybe we would have seen lots of lots of progress, but population aging is is a fact. But nonetheless, uh, cancer mortality numbers are are increasing uh, at a uh, much lower rate than cancer incidence. So that's a great sign of progress. And that's what's reflected in the increasing survival rates that, you, that you've already seen. And then I will, that I will get back to in just one slide or two slides. Uh, because before I'll talk about survival, I wanted to look a little bit ahead because now I just look back in time, but let's look, also look ahead in time. What, what's gonna happen in the next 20 years or so uh, to the uh, cancer incidence and cancer mortality in Ireland? And there are predictions made by the WHO and their uh, Cancer Institute. Uh, and they show in fact that due to overall population growth and population aging, uh, it's likely that the number of new uh, cancer cases will, will just steadily increase from around 24,000 cases that we have currently to over 40,000 cases per year in the year 2040. But if we actually look back in time, how cancer uh, incidence numbers have developed during the past 20 years, then actually the increase uh, looks to be the dashed line at the very top. So we will not just see 40,000 new cases of cancer, we might even reach 50,000 uh, cases uh, of newly diagnosed cancer by the year 2040. Uh, 
And uh, it's a bit the opposite for cancer mortality because there we have seen these improvements or crude rates and age standardized rates going down. So if we look a little bit ahead and would hope that this positive development that we have seen continues, then there might still be an overall increase in the number of deaths from around 10 to 15,000, but it's not going to be the 20,000 that are currently predicted to happen by, by the WHO. Um, and now talking about cancer survival, so you've already seen the 65%, uh, which is the latest statistics on the five-year survival rate overall, over all cancers in, in Ireland. Uh, and that uh, is a situation that looks much better than uh, 20 years ago. So for patients diagnosed in 1994 to 1998, it was really just 42% that uh, survived five years after their diagnosis. It's now it's 65%. So a huge improvement, which is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. But, uh, but you know, the other countries in, in Europe also have seen uh, improvements in, in, in their survival rates. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not unique, this development in Ireland, that there have been improvements. And in fact, when we compare Ireland to other EU countries, and now I'm looking at this EU 15 country, so the old EU 15 that includes the UK, um, then um, actually Ireland ranks uh, last as here for breast cancer or close to the bottom of the, of the, of the ranking. So when we remove the Eastern European friends from the European statistics and just focus on, on, on Western Europe, uh, then Ireland, Ireland's positive development looks a bit less, uh, less impressive, I would say. Uh, and then, of course, the question is also a bit, so if Ireland were to improve its survival rates to, to the rates that we are actually seeing in, in other EU15 countries, what would that mean to, to cancer patients in Ireland? Uh, so we did some, some calculations on this and, and found looking at um, six major cancer types that you see here, so prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung, melanoma, and ovarian cancer. Uh, we looked at the Irish survival rates and, and then uh, looked at who was the best performing country in the EU15 and then tried to estimate how many deaths that would be potentially avoidable in Ireland if it were as good as, for instance, Sweden or or Finland or, or whoever leads the, the statistics in, for the particular cancer case. Uh, and, and we find that when you sum up sum up all of these red pieces of the of the bars here, that hundreds of deaths could actually be avoided every year if Ireland were to improve its quality of, of cancer care. And that's just, you know, six six major cancer types, but if we could extend this to other cancer types and then you would see uh, even uh, even more potentially avoidable uh, cancer deaths. Now I'm going to stop speaking about uh, epidemiology and I'm going to focus on, on the costs. I'm a health economist after all because uh, trying to achieve good outcomes for patients is is amazing and the fact that Ireland was able to do that is, is absolutely brilliant but uh, it also comes with a cost and especially since the number of cancer cases is rising uh, that means there are more patients to being taken care of. And we did some estimates on how much Ireland is spending on, on cancer care. Uh, there are no official statistics available. We asked the Department of Health in Ireland whether they know how much the HSE, for instance, is spending on cancer care, but there, there are no official statistics available. So what we did was to estimate how much Ireland might spend on, on cancer care. And what we've seen during the past decade, Ireland seems to spend uh, essentially uh, at a similar level as the EU15 average. And in 2018, this amounted to around 230 euros per capita or over 1 billion uh, euros. Uh, and that's just the healthcare spending. Um, but then the economic burden of cancer is much broader. It's not just how much we spend on cancer care, but there are also indirect costs of cancer. And indirect costs of cancer are productivity loss from cancer patients dying prematurely and those of working age uh, dying prematurely or patients of working age having to be on, on sick leave due to receiving treatment uh, and support and or patients having to retire early. All of that is a loss to the economy because if they would not have had cancer, they would have uh, been able to work, contribute to society. So that sort of value that we're losing from those patients, those are indirect costs. 
And here, for indirect costs, here we see actually a decline in, in, in the costs over time since 2000 uh, in Ireland, also in the EU. And this is due to the improvements that we have seen on the epidemiological side and in the survival rates. More and more patients are surviving their, their cancer. So that actually has a positive impact uh, on, on our economy. So we are curing more patients, which is amazing, but also the economy is benefiting indirectly from this uh, improvements in health outcomes that we see. Now, and another thing that I want to talk about is um, what happens when we piece this uh, information that I talked about together, piece the, the inputs, the spending on cancer care, together with uh, the survival rates, the outcomes, what we achieve. So this is some sort of um, health performance assessment, a very, very crude way uh, of doing this, but it's essentially looking at inputs, spending on Here we put in all EU countries and even some additional non-EU countries in Europe uh, and looked at how much they're spending, what do they uh, achieve for four major cancer types. And overall, you see a positive association, um, meaning that spending more on, on cancer care seems to result in, in, in better outcomes in higher survival rates, uh, which is uh, probably what you would expect to find, but we do find it. Uh, but then when you look at the relative position of countries, and in particular Ireland, which I marked with uh, red arrows here, is that Ireland seems to be located either on the line, on the average uh, efficiency line, or below it, uh, which indicates that we are spending actually qu quite a lot, but not achieving as much as we could, or as others that achieve, uh, that, that spend equally much uh, uh, achieve with, with the money spent. So, so in terms of, of spending and results achieved, it seems seems to be Ireland seems to be in a bit of an uh, inefficient uh, situation. But again, it would be more reassuring to 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 do this analysis once we have concrete data from the HSE in Ireland on how much Ireland is actually spending spending on cancer care. So we're here we're making just a rough rough guess. Um, but uh, I th I think uh, I also don't want you you know, to overinterpret this picture. I mean, it's not it's not a question of throwing money at patients and hoping that patients will become healthy by just, you know, by uh, throwing euro bills at them. That's certainly not the case. It's really about thinking through where should you put your money in cancer care? Where will it provide you the best uh, value for, for the money? And when you think about that, uh, I think it's important to keep the big picture in mind. Cancer needs to be tackled very comprehensively. Uh, here you see four pillars, uh, the four pillars uh, called prevention, early detection, which includes screening, diagnosis and treatment, and survivorship. These are the, the, the four pillars that you also find in Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, which was unveiled by our uh, president, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, two years ago. And um, uh, and in all of these four areas, uh, you have to think about how should you invest money to make sure you get the most value, value out of that, out, out of it, because all four areas matter in the end for for cancer patients. But what did it, what we did in the in the report um, was to look uh, more specifically into one area, the the area of diagnosis and treatment, and specifically into uh, the current situation of cancer medicines, because this is really the most dynamic area in cancer care, uh, or has been the most dynamic area in cancer care over the last uh, two decades. And you see this in particular on this graph here, which shows you the number of new cancer medicines that the European Medicines Agency in Amsterdam uh, has approved over the years. And you see that, you know, in the back in the second half of the 1990s, it was just on average, one new cancer medicine that was was approved. Uh, then between, let's say, 2004 and 2011, it was around four new medicines. Then we made a jump. 2012 to 2020 was around 10 new medicines. And in, during the last two years, 2021, 2022, um, 15 new cancer medicines or, or more. So we've seen a, a rapid development of of new uh, cancer medicines coming coming to the market. Uh, the question is, of course, 
hefty reach patients uh, uh, and to what extent does that differ between between Europe? Uh, and we looked at that uh, a little bit in our on our report. So here's a picture of uh, um, how much new cancer medicines were actually used in in different cancer types. And I took the example of breast cancer and of immunotherapies, which is a type of uh, or a class of of cancer medicines that are used across uh, a broad range of of cancer types. Uh, but if we look at the situation for, for breast cancer, for instance, so I, I included the use of some newer um, cancer medicines, which have been approved since the year 2000. So I guess in some contexts, some of them are not that new, but fairly new, let's say. Uh, and uh, for these fairly new medicines or new medicines in breast cancer, Ireland seems to rank just above uh, the European average or the EU15 average. Uh, when it comes to the uptake of immunotherapies, uh, which have been launched more recently compared to the year 2018 that we looked at, uh, then Ireland looks uh, ranked below the EU average. So for sort of these newer medicines, a little bit of a lower ranking, below average for breast cancer, above average. And we looked at many more cancer types, and it's always the same picture that Ireland seems to be just above or just below the average uh, when it comes to actual use of, of cancer medicines in, in clinical practice. But one thing that we realized is seems to be a, an issue uh, is really access to, to the newer medicines. Um, so once they are approved and reimbursed by the HSE, they seem to be used quite broadly uh, among all eligible cancer patients, let's say. But until they reach the patients, that seems to take a lot of time in Ireland. Uh, so at least up to uh, up until 2020, cancer patients in Ireland waited uh, around two years for when a new medicine was approved by the EMA in Amsterdam until it was reimbursed by the HSE. Uh, and that sort of delay is second longest. You see that on on the picture to the to the right. Second longest in the EU15. Only in Portugal it takes. Uh, 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 e even longer. Uh, and I mean, I, I mean, that delay is sort of a function of two things. One thing is um, how long it takes for a company that has uh, developed and is marketing a, a new medicine to, to apply for reimbursement in our Ireland. That's first delay. And then the second delay is for the NCPE within the HSE to make its, uh, its, its assessment of, of the cancer medicine. Uh, and that sort of process, so company filing application uh, for reimbursement and then the NCPE assessing uh, the application and HSE making the decision that uh, takes in Ireland twice as long as in Sweden, even though we basically do the same thing. We also look at cost effectiveness of, of the drugs. So every um, <clears throat> company has to submit uh, an, an, cost of, uh, an application that includes a cost effectiveness analysis and so on. But we are able to do this within one year. In Ireland, it takes uh, on average, on average, uh, uh, two years. So that's, that was surprising to me, uh, to be honest, to, to find this because the situation that Ireland and Sweden are facing, it, it's really, it, it's really, it's really the same, very similar systems. Um, and then the question is, so it takes a bit longer uh, in Ireland or twice as long as in Sweden for, for patients to access new cancer uh, medicines, um, is there a cost to that? Is, is that an issue uh, or is it okay to have pa patients wait? Uh, we believe there, there is actually a cost to that. There is an opportunity cost to having patients wait for new and effective cancer medicines. I'm emphasizing here effective cancer medicines. So those where we know based on clinical trials that you really improve uh, uh, survival. Um, because for those medicines, we know that if patients wait, we're losing out on life years if we keep administering the old standard of care instead of the new standard of care. Uh, we're losing qualities, quality just at life years. We might also be uh, facing adverse events that would have not been necessary with the new standard of care uh, that patients still experience with the old standard of care and also the treatment cost, of course, associated with treating adverse events. And indirect costs for productivity loss, because if patients survive uh, cancer with the new standard of care compared to the current old standard of care, then uh, 
then we're also losing in terms of the indirect cost productivity loss. And we did some calculations uh, where we actually looked at a handful of cancer medicines, just 11 indications of cancer medicines that were approved by the EMA uh, very recently uh, between 2015 and 2021. And we really only selected um, cancer medicines with a proven um, for a proven improvement in median overall survival. So we know that they're working based on the results from, from uh, clinical trials. And we did some calculations on how much we're losing. And just for these 11 cancer medicines, and you've seen on the picture before when you looked at the EMA approvals, there are many more new cancer medicines being approved. But just for these 11 indications, uh, the annual number of patients affected by these delays is uh, 1,500 patients are being affected. Uh, and they jointly lose almost 2,600 life, life years. Uh, 1,000 of those are lost by people of working age, so people uh, aged 15 to 64 years. And for those people, we incur a productivity loss that amounts to 30, uh, 34 million uh, euros. So that's a significant number that we that we lose from the fact that it just takes a little longer in Ireland to get access to new cancer medicines. So by, by cutting the numbers in half, uh, uh, just as we do it in, in Sweden, you know, you could cut all of those numbers that you see in the table to the right in half. So you see that there are monetary gains also from being a bit quicker uh, in, in bringing new and in innovative medicines into the Irish market and to patients. So key points from my presentation. Uh, cancer is the leading cause of, uh, of death in, in Ireland and the number of cancer cases is, is still rising sharply. So there's really a need to look into ways to improve the current situation. Uh, and when it comes to survival rates, maybe I have some sort of a different picture than, than Deirdre before, uh, maybe a bit less positive. So there have been these improvements, which is amazing, but compared to the EU 15 countries, they, they're not that impressive, I would say. Um, I've also shown you this picture on the positive association between spending and and achieving good outcomes for patients. So that's something that's something to keep in mind, uh, especially when you want to uh, consider where should I put my money, what should I invest in, uh, and we looked especially into this area of new cancer medicines, which seems to be an area in need of uh, future improvement in Ireland. So with that, I, I think I'm going to close my presentation and then uh, look forward to the next speaker. Thank you. That's fantastic. Many thanks, Thomas. And we'll come back to you with questions uh, as part of the panel in a, in a, in a little later. Uh, but now we'll move to our third speaker, who is Rachel Morrow. Rachel holds a degree in economics and politics and a master's in politics from UCD. Now working as the director of advocacy and external affairs at the Irish Cancer Society, Rachel is an experienced campaigner with extensive advocacy and policy experience, having worked previously in the Oireachtas, large multinationals, public affairs consultancy, and in the non-profit sector for more than 15 years. So Rachel, I'll hand over. You're still on mute, Rachel. Thanks for it. <laughs> I'm still a technophobe. Um, thanks very much. Perfect. Um, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to to thank the organisers, um, the RCSI, um, Janssen, Novartis and UI for asking me to contribute today. Um, and I've really enjoyed listening to um, the, the previous two speakers. And I hope there's something that I can add um, to this discussion um, from the Irish Cancer Society's perspective. So in terms of what um, I'm going to cover over the next 15 minutes, um, I'm going to focus on how improvements in cancer care have impacted all of us um, as a society, um, because I'd, I'd agree certainly um, with Professor Murray that cancer care is one of Ireland's um, major su success stories. Um, it's led to many of us being able to share more time um, with the people we love. Um, but of course, no system is perfect. Um, and I'll discuss what isn't working from a patient's point of view um, and why we have to keep on pushing for further improvements, um, despite... Sorry Rachel. Um, sorry, Rachel, can yeah? I just... Sorry to interrupt you here. If I could just ask you to amend your display settings. Uh, sure. To what? To swap presenter view? So we want view? swap presenter view on slideshow. 
Does that look is that better? okay on your end? Yeah, yeah. Is that all right? Fantastic. And if our attendees can just confirm that they can see that as well. Lovely. Sorry for interrupting you, right? <laughs> no, that's fine. Sorry, but um, I've now made two mistakes. I'm only on slide two. Um, so hopefully that isn't going to be the case um, throughout this presentation. Um, but I'm going to just, um, like the previous speaker said, just focus on the diminishing purchasing power as well. And he described it as, as inefficiencies. Um, but the, the, the decreasing purchasing power, I suppose, when it comes to health gains um, for every euro that we spend um, on cancer care. And that's no not so much because of the the cancer system i don't think um it's more because of kind of systemic issues um with um the, the health service um i'm going to discuss the phenomenon um here that exists in many comparable um european countries as well and um, where marginalized communities do not have the same chance um of benefiting from population level interventions um, and therefore get left behind when it comes to cancer survival and, and we call that the cancer gap um, and i'm also going to outline to you what we hear from patients and families um, about the reality of life after cancer um, and focus on um, people's quality of life and non-medical um, needs um, once they experience a cancer diagnosis. And finally, um, I hope that my presentation will not only illustrate um, to you that despite improving outcomes, there's more to be done um, and that I believe that we, we can do it um, if we all work together um, with a common purpose. So that's what I'm going to cover over the, the next um, 15 uh, minutes. So um, Professor Murray covered um, this, this very well, um, but cancer is very much a success story um, over a very recent period. Um, and without giving away exactly how old I am, um, between the time I finished primary school um, and today, um, there has been a very significant increase um, in cancer survival from four in 10 um, people surviving at least five years after treatment 30 years ago um, to six in 10 today. Um, and, and that really is a credit to everybody working um, in cancer services. Um, the number of cancer survivors in Ireland um, has increased significantly. Um, one in every 22 people in Ireland um, is now living with the history of of an invasive cancer and that's about four percent of the population and that's thanks to screening early detection and um, new treatments and um, improvements in public cancer services including the centralization that professor murray um, mentioned but many more of us are getting cancer um, and that's due to the population growth and um, an aging population um, and and lifestyle factors um, so we do have this this burning platform um, to do more and um, that although there has been like a lot of historical success um, equally th there's more for us to do um, so Oh, sorry, cancer cases are expected um, to increase by at least 50% and um, potentially double to 2045. Um, and over the next 10 years, um, around 500,000 people will be diagnosed with cancer, around 250,000 of them with um, an invasive cancer. So the question that, sh that we have and that we need to ask ourselves, I'm sure everybody on the call, um, you know, comes up against the question, are, are cancer services um, prepared for this? Um, so in terms of um, cancer services or what patients are going through, um, I think that it's worthwhile kind of looking back um, to before the pandemic because it's really important um, that, that we focus on how cancer services were performing without a pandemic layered um, on top of them. Um, so if you look on the, the top left quote there, that's from the services plan um, in 2019. Um, and it said that um, However, the NCCP allocation for 2019 will not be able to service um, to match the referral demands in areas such as radiotherapy, rapid access clinics and diagnostics. Um, and that means that the NCCP was, um, I suppose, unable to meet that referral demand. That obviously had a significant impact um, on patients. Um, so the question is, even before the pandemic, um, was it set up for for success in continuing um, to deliver the, that accelerated progress um, that, that was described by, by previous speakers in terms of um, improving outcomes? And below that, um, there's a quote directly from the National Cancer Strategy. Um, the former Minister for Health, Simon Harris, said that um, it's all down to implementation in terms of the, the strategy, yet 
the the funding um, that was given to the strategy and the resources um, did not match um, that ambition. Um, and you'll see over on the kind of the top right um, that in 2020 there was an allocation of, of 3.5 million. Um, now in reality, um, there was a lot of additional funding um, from the winter plan um, and and COVID um, income streams. Um, but the NCCP, um, you know, had a very ambitious 10-year strategy to deliver, um, and I don't feel was really resourced um, to be able to do that. Um, but they still managed to deliver um, significant parts of that strategy um, with, with very little funding. Um, so things like survivorship and psycho-oncology services, there's models of care um, in place for them, um, which has a, a, a real and meaningful difference um, for people who go uh, who experience cancer. Um, the further centralization of cancer, cancer surgery, which we know from Deirdre's presentation is so important. Um, medical um, oncology consultants and nursing staff um, were recruited um, and there is thankfully now um, an early diagnosis strategy as well. Um, so they managed to do a lot um, with, but uh, I, I feel that they weren't empowered um, to do more. So you can see at the bottom, um, those are our rapid access um, clinic um, uh, KPIs um, in 2019. So again, before the pandemic, um, and they weren't reaching their target. The target is 95% of people should be seen um, within the time frame set out in the National Cancer Strategy, um, and that wasn't happening at that stage. Um, so in terms of what's happening today, so a lot of good things have been happening. So there still is um, significant progress being being made. So long waiters have been taken off um, waiting lists. Now the waiting list is still far, far too long, but those very long waiters um, who may have been waiting for, in some cases, um, more than a year for, for an appointment, they've, they've um, been worked off through the private system. Um, funding for the National Cancer Strategy has been provided by the current Minister for Health, which, which is great. There's been um, an allocation of funding for new medicines, um, the National Cancer Information System, system um, is being rolled out. There's a skin cancer prevention plan and um, the SCP has published um, a plan for early diagnosis of cancer and um, we have in place those models of care, survivorship and, and psycho-oncology um, the, the NCCP um, and Cancer Care West as well as the Irish Cancer Society came together um, to provide psychological support for people through together for cancer concern um, and cancer research is taking place. Um, so before I go on to the next slide, I do really want to underscore the fact that the, the NCCP and the Department of Health um, have both been working extremely hard to continue to make progress in very difficult circumstances and these things um, make a real impact um, to people affected by cancer. But with regard to what cancer patients are experiencing today, um, the Irish Cancer Society continues to undertake research. We undertake um, an omnibus quarterly so that we can establish um, the experiences of people trying to access health services. One in two people don't think that they will be able to access health care if they need to. Um, one in five people have not gone to a GP um, despite being symptomatic. Um, so we surveyed them um, over November, December and January um, and one in five people said they, they would not go to a GP. And you, if you remember, that was when the, um, the health service was were really under uh, very significant pressures. Um, so we're actually seeing an increase from 13% in March last year um, up to um, one in five people um, currently. So that's going in the wrong direction um, because we want to, we were hoping that after COVID that more people would access um, health services um, when they notice something um, significant in terms of a sign or symptom. Um, and lots of people have returned to healthcare, but what we're worried about is that the health service itself may be acting as a barrier um, to care. So one in five of those people have not gone to a GP um, because of the cost, um, which is around 75 or 80 euros um, for some people. So because of the cost of living um, situation that was facing people, particularly earlier in the winter, um, what we were finding was that people were putting their health on the back burner um, while they prioritised other things um, like, like electricity bills, utilities, Christmas, um, and, and they decided not to go and see their GP. Um, at the moment, some oncology day wards are running very late into the evening, um, and this results in exhausted staff um, and patients um, who then often have to travel back um, home um, late in the evening or at night, um, and that's both demoralising for staff um, and it's upsetting for patients as well. 
um, so some surgeries um, are still being cancelled and being rescheduled um, for off-site care which underscores the, the challenges facing the public system still. Um, radiology waiting lists are over 200,000 um, people on a radiology waiting list. And although people with red flag symptoms um, are prioritised as urgent and get timelier access to care, it's the people who are not classified as urgent um, who we in the Cancer Society are particularly worried about um, if, if they don't have um, a, a a normal symptom um, of cancer, they may have to wait um, too long um, to get that radiology appointment. And um, the rapid access clinics are still not able to meet their targets, and um, although they're doing they're doing very well, um, considering the, the the stresses of the of the health services, and um, too few people are being offered radiation therapy. Um, Sip2 um, uh, said a number of weeks ago that four machines are currently closed due to staffing shortages. Um, so that that's of of major concern to us in the Cancer Society. As well, we know that staff um, are very burned out, um, and that may be leading um, to the the challenges with regard to staff retention. I think it's a lot of focus um, on recruitment, but we have very experienced staff um, working in cancer services, um, and if they are not going to remain in post, um, then we're not going to be able to can be able to fight cancer um, to, to the degree that we would like. And like Professor Murray mentioned, the OECD um, recently published a country profile of Ireland um, and it called out that cost is a barrier to early diagnosis um, and the delays in diagnoses um, are Ireland's biggest hurdle to timely access to care. So really um, we're, we're pleased that the NCCP has, has published this report on, on how to get more people diagnosed earlier um, but there are a number of, of um, things that we think will act as barriers um, and there are systemic issues that really need to be addressed politically. Um, so with regard to the cancer gap, um, I just mentioned in the intro, um, there is a gap in outcomes between cancers um, as well as between communities and the NCRI under um, Professor Murray has recently published um, a, a really insightful report um, which showed that um, those from most deprived areas had a 28% higher mortality risk um, due to cancer within five years of diagnosis compared to those in the least deprived areas. Um, survival has advanced little for some cancers um, and, and is very high um, for others. Um, the, the NCRI and the Irish Cancer Society um, back in 2018 um, published a report around um, cancers that are diagnosed in emergency departments um, and surprisingly one in seven invasive cancers is actually diagnosed in an ED um, and three in four of them are at an advanced stage. Um, what we found was that cancer patients from the most disadvantaged communities um, are 50% more likely to be diagnosed via emergency um, rather than those from the most affluent um, communities. Um, and in terms of the profile of those patients, nearly three in four emergency cases involve patients over 65 um, compared with just over half of um, elective cases and older patients are twice as likely to present as emergencies. Um, you can see there the, the profile of cancers um, that, are, that are diagnosed um, um, in emergency departments, um, and many of you would know that, um, that those are cancers, many of them, which do not um, have good outcomes. So really, um, we, we need to not just focus on, I suppose, the, the population level figures when we talk about cancer survival, um, but really like very targeted approaches to making sure that everybody um, is able to experience um, the, the positives from, um, from cancer care um, in Ireland. Um, so the the focus has very much been on survival, and that obviously has been um, a, a a very positive thing um, for for cancer patients over the last thirty years. Um, but the NCCP rightly um, focused on the fact that the quality of life um, after cancer um, can sometimes um, not be optimal. Um, we know in the Cancer Society that cancer does disrupt um, every aspect of a patient's life um, and this is really what we hear most about. It's about the, the physical, the emotional, the social, the financial um, consequences of cancer um, and many more. So many of these negative effects um, last for years and they have a really, really significant impact on patients and their loved ones. So we've run a number of campaigns, um, some of the 
kind of slogans are, are, are here. Um, but Leave Your Leave is about the fact that a, um, a woman who's diagnosed with cancer um, while on maternity leave, she has to use her maternity leave um, to undergo cancer treatment. She can't postpone that, even though if you're a man, you can um, postpone your paternity leave. Um, the real cost of cancer, that's focused on the financial impact of cancer. Um, and the right to be forgotten um, is a campaign that we're running um, so that you will not be penalised by the insurance or banking industry um, if you survived cancer for five years um, post-treatment. So again, we're grateful to the NCCP for prioritising um, this, but there really is no return to normal for many people. So I'm just going to play a clip um, from News Talk. Um, I think it was about three or four months ago, um, and um, the, the speaker here is being interviewed um, about the, the cost um, of cancer. Hi Rachel, I'm afraid that's not coming up, I think, on the oh. speakers, at least for me. OK, is it no one else is able to hear that either, are they not? OK, it doesn't matter, I can circulate the slides um, at, at another point. Thanks, Ronan. Ronan, could you hear that? No, I'm afraid it's not coming through, Rachel. OK, I think we might have lost Rachel. I think she was coming to the end of her presentation in any event. So we have um, just about 15 minutes for, for questions. Um, so I might ask Thomas and Deirdre to put on their, their cameras, if that's OK. That's great. And we might just and again, if you, if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat and we'll get to as many as we can in, in the short time that we have available to us. You just see Rachel coming back on here. Sorry about that. <laughs> you're, you're fine. We're, go, we're going to go into Q&A now, if that's right. OK, Rachel. Um, so, um, Deirdre, I just might start with yourself. I mean, obviously we're seeing an increase in cancer incidence in some respects. And I'm just wondering, what your view is on, on why we top the European legal league tables, for for instance? Yeah, I suppose that's a question that um, certainly in the cancer control, in the registry, in the cancer control program, and in the Department of Health is is, is that we kind of struggle with a little bit. Um, now, I suppose first of all, the those uh, those figures are estimates that are done by the uh, by the uh, European Cancer Information System, <clears throat> and they're based on they are based on some data that we would send over to IRC and those sort of folks uh, a number of years ago when the Irish population was aging more quickly than it is now. So I think it's based on maybe a more rapid acceleration uh, in terms of aging. Um, we also know that like, we're very good at, and this is kind of tooting my own trump, trumpet, very good at population capture. Like, you know, uh, <clears throat> it is, it's a full population registry and I think we capture we, we we capture a lot so like we've, we're very good from that perspective and again not all of, of uh, European registries would be full population so we have a luxury in Ireland um, that, that we don't have elsewhere and I suppose the other issue then is like Ireland is relatively late in introducing screening programs you know I mean a lot of the Nordic countries would have had cervical screening for, for decades at this stage um, equally with the UK ours has all come in in the last 10 or 15 years. And as we know, that disrupts the epidemiology of cancer and that you detect much more cancer early. Um, uh, obviously, with and colorectal would be the same. We would hope now, we've seen the, the, the decreasing incidence of cancer with cervical cancer um, post the introduction of screening and hope to see the same with colorectal. But other countries are just a couple of decades ahead of us in, in, in those sort of areas. So there are some of my thoughts um, as to how, why, why, we, why we top the league. Yeah. OK, OK, thanks, Deirdre. And, and then, Thomas, you mentioned the four the four pillars, uh, and obviously there's a whole range of different areas that we can invest in at any point in time from prevention right through to survivorship. I'm wondering from a health economics perspective, 
What area or areas of that journey do you think are, are most worthwhile to invest in? Well, I think there are so many good examples for all of these areas where you should put your money into. Uh, prevention, I, I would go for HPV uh, vaccination. Uh, I mean, all cost effectiveness analysis that have been conducted around the world show, at least for girls, it's extremely cost effective, if not cost saving. Uh, and even for boys, it, it's it, it's cost effective. So, and we have the tool actually to eliminate a single cancer type cervical cancer. Uh, with HPV vaccination. So that, that's one area. For early detection, I mean, you have now, as Deirdre just said, uh, implemented these three screening programs for colorectal cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer, which is great. But it's always interesting to see that all countries sort of introduce them in an order, which is the complete reverse to what's the cost effective uh, uh, or what cost effectiveness would, would, would demand to, 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 or, uh, to be introduced because colorectal cancer screening is always the most cost effective one. So I would always go for that one and not introduce it last, which was the case in, in Ireland. Um, uh, area of diagnosis and treatment, as, as Rachel said, I mean, there are huge issues currently, patients waiting for radiation therapy. Uh, during the last few years, we have seen uh, what's called uh, hypofractionated uh, radiation therapy, which means you get fewer doses uh, or at fewer times, but at a higher dosage at that time. So you say you can you can go from having to 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 go to hospital like uh, six weeks in a row. You can do it now in three or even two weeks for prostate cancer, breast cancer. That saves money and time for patients, but also for healthcare staff. I mean, that's how you can address all of these uh, long waiting lists uh, or sh staff shortages that, that you have in that area. But it's something new. You know, it has to be implemented. Uh, and that's that's always a bit of a struggle. Uh, other examples for, for treatment, I mean, uh, I would focus on some of the, you know, really major breakthrough ther therapies that we have seen during the past decade. CAR T cell therapy is one example where we're really able to cure a large fraction now of patients. It took very long time to implement this in, in Ireland. You had to ship your patients to the UK actually to get these uh, these therapies, right? You couldn't even treat them in, in Ireland. Now, now they are finally being treated in Ireland, but it's mind blowing. <laughs> Why don't you treat them in, in, in Ireland in, in the first place? How, how, is, how is that possible? Because uh, at least because there are lots of cancer medicines. Uh, coming to the market and not all of them are equally good, but at least the major ones that really are these breakthroughs that get the Nobel Prize in medicine. I mean, at least for those, can't we focus uh, on them? And even though there is might be a cost barrier because in the end, it's always about the costs. I mean, what we did in other countries, we developed payment models for CAR T cell therapies because it was just impossible to pay for this new drug all at once. So we said we split it up into five years uh, and, and then, that's a viable solution for for everyone. So, so that was um, that, that. Yeah, that was a question I had for you actually, and I might I might ask this one now as it leads on from from your comments there. So Sweden, you said typically takes a year from approval to 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 for patients to access new medicines versus two years here. So what what is it that's so ra maybe rather than focusing on Ireland and the answer to this question is what what is Sweden doing uh, to facilitate that process happening over the course of just one year? No, well, I think we have a very well structured uh, process, uh, but but then again, I mean, it so it, it's it's a it's a two stage component, right? The company has to file, and and then the HTA assessment body has to make its assessment and then recommendations, uh, and so I don't know the statistics on on whether companies file their applications faster, for instance, in Sweden compared to Ireland. I mean, if a company anticipates that it will take a long time to get reimbursement in Ireland anyways, then Ireland will never be on the top priority list, whereas if they know that they can expect to get faster access in Sweden. So maybe Sweden is just higher up on, the, on their priority list. So it's sort of a vicious circle with the current situation that you have in Ireland sure. at the moment. OK, OK. Um, Rachel. Obviously, a core a core point was that the resources and funding didn't uh, match the, the the ambition that was set out in the the national cancer strategy. And I guess if I relate that to one of Thomas's points, which was the indirect costs of cancer, and the fact that as we see more cancer cases, um, and and albeit those have decreased over recent years, but I guess there's there's a message in there that an increasing uh, burden of cancer will impact on the economy more broadly. 
And I just wonder if you have thoughts on how we better communicate that message to policymakers across uh, across the spectrum, as opposed to just necessarily perhaps in the Department of Health, as an example, to convince people to invest in this from a from 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 an econ economy perspective. I think that there is an awareness in the Department of Health. Um, I think that over the last um, three years that you know adequate funding has been made available to I suppose set the NCCP up for success and to make sure that it can continue to to implement the National Cancer Strategy but we're now at a midway point um, and I imagine that the NCCP kind of isn't where it wants to be in terms of the implementation um, of that strategy. And I think that you're right about looking outside of the department um, to maybe consider where the, the ultimate decision maker is when it comes certainly to funding. Um, I think that that is outside of the department, but there's so many issues that affect cancer services and the implementation of the cancer strategy um, that are these systemic issues that all of us know about. Um, and I think that particularly with regard to the cancer workforce. Um, I think that they've been asked to do more with less and they've been, that isn't just over um, the period of the pandemic, that goes back for at least over a decade. Um, and I think that if we don't treat the people who are caring for us well and they don't want to stay working in the health services, um, then how are we ever going to continue to improve um, cancer care? And I'm thinking particularly around people like radiation therapists and nurses um, who, you know, they can probably have um, a, a better life, um, a better working environment um, outside of um, the public system at the moment. And I think that that's something that we all need to reflect on, particularly because of the number of us um, that are going to be using those health services ourselves. Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Deirdre, I might come back to you. Uh, a theme that's come up across some of the questions and, and it came up a little bit through the presentations as well is that whilst we have lots of data and lots of information, we're, there's there's still some holes in that in terms of really allowing us to, to interrogate some of the patterns more, uh, more precisely or more thoroughly. I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how we improve that and um, you know, particularly if you have any thoughts on the, the National Cancer Information System and where where improvements might be coming in the years ahead around our understanding of what's happening in, in the cancer space in Ireland. Yeah, well, I suppose, you know, the, the one thing that is outstanding and is an, has been outstanding for the whole of my career is a unique identifier, which would make some things, you know, which would make linking patients across um across hospitals so much easier uh, and that that has been uh that has been a a bugbear for um for cancer for all all types of uh, health information systems but for the cancer ones particularly because patients do tend to move between hospitals for their care for different aspects um both de designed by structure or by their own um inter by their own so to say preference people may decide to have some aspects in the private sector for example um so that's that's a huge one i mean the national cancer Inf information system um at the registry are really looking forward to 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 that 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 rollout it'll be huge for the for the drug side of things that's particularly where we find it really difficult to get information because um if it's not written in the notes it's it's nearly impossible to get anywhere so i think that will be that that will help to to give us more real time information on on how patients um activity of patients in in the public hospital systems but you know we we do have to start focusing on data in Ireland. Like I mean, uh, I suppose we saw it with COVID, uh, and, the, and the public kind of saw how uh, how data drove decision making. And in fact, the general public were taking their own decisions when they saw those numbers going up every day. Um, but we need to have that same you know data driven decision making in cancer and all the other aspects of our healthcare system. And at the moment. Uh, our systems are not fit for purpose. Like there's no doubt about that. Um, and the Department of Health would say that if they were here as well too. They know they're not. Uh, it, 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 we need a, a substantial investment uh, to be able to come. And I wouldn't even say close to where some some, some of the Nor Nordic countries are. Um, but even to 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 be able to get to that kind of real time data that we need for for managing health services and for for seeing the outcomes. I mean, I, I thought. Um, Thomas's issue about our investment was fascinating slides. I mean, that's a that, that's a huge question. 
we're putting money in. Why is it? Why is it not impacting on our survival? You know, where is that money going? And we just don't know. We just don't know. So, um, yeah, we have to invest in our information systems. OK, thanks. Thanks, Deirdre. And, and Thomas, coming to you on, on a related area. So it's come up a few times in 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 the uh, in the questions. It's around whether you've done any work which demonstrates a link between the volume or activity, the, the amount of activity happening around clinical trials and outcomes within a particular country. And I'd probably extend that just given Deirdre's comments to say, if you, to ask if you've done any work equally, which looks at the quality of the cancer information systems in a particular country and uh, outcomes. Those are, those are both great research ideas, actually. <laughs> we have not looked into them. But 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 yeah no this this should be studied really uh, we know that in Europe I mean there are studies that uh, really have looked at systematically how many what's the percentage of patients in a country that is enrolled in clinical trials and we see huge differences between Western and Eastern Europe for instance I mean hardly any cancer patients are, are enrolled in, in Eastern Europe much better in in Western Europe but even within Western Europe there are differences and I mean that gives patients the chance to 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 get access to the very latest uh, cancer medicines with, without any uh, delay, whether this affects the outcomes. I think, yeah, I, I want to study this actually. Thank you for this idea. <laughs> okay, so maybe next year you can come back and give us more information. <laughs> um, Rachel, I'll, I'll finish just with one last question. You, you obviously uh, referenced the, the difficulties that some people are having at the moment around access mm -hmm. to primary care. Mm -hmm. And obviously with the move towards um, you know, with the emphasis on launch care, the move to regional health areas and the and the the focus on primary and community care. I guess the question I have is whether you have thoughts on how we approach the 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 uh, how we approach cancer in primary and community care differently from perhaps how we do that today, uh, with reference back to the to the, the statistics you gave in the slide. I think that the the challenges with regard to primary care is again it's another area of the health service that hasn't really been set up for success we know the number of um gps who are retiring at the moment we know the number of people who are going to who, who want to access gps at the moment and maybe aren't and maybe aren't listed with a gp um, we know that there's going to be a lot more people who need to use primary care so i don't really understand why we're not cherishing the people who are working in cancer services, primary care or health services today. Like we know from the pandemic that people prioritise their health amongst pretty much anything else. We know that it was a political issue at the last election um, and yet we're not seeing the kind of progress that we need to see um, so that we continue to make that accelerated progress um, that, that Deirdre described earlier. Um, and I think that accessing primary care is it's almost like it's a fundamental right, really, I believe, um, for all of us. I don't think that cost should be a barrier, nor do I think that waiting lists should be a barrier. But we know that both of those things um, are making it more difficult for people to access it, to access primary care at the moment. Um, I'd be concerned about the, the future and those big increases um, in people with suspected cancers um, that are coming. And the Cancer Society, we, we always say, you know, if there's anything that's unexplained, unusual or persistent, go and see your GP, um, but are people able to, to access their GP? Um, and particularly in the, the environment that the winter period, um, when people were told not to go to their emergency department, but to go and see um, the, the primary care providers or community providers, that it wasn't really realistic um, for people to be able to do that. Um, so I think that we just like I acknowledge that you know Sloan care is what all of us want and like the cancer strategy it had buy-in from lots and lots of different stakeholders um but unless we really think about those systemic issues um and how we're going to make sure that um we're set up to deal with the wave of future cancer cases um, then I think that we're fighting it with one hand behind our back. OK, thanks, Rachel. And I, I'm just conscious of time, um, so we might conclude the, the, the Q&A session there. And really, I just want to thank all of you for, for your insights and presentations today. I think they were excellent and I think they've served as a very useful foundation stone for the, for the other episodes in this uh, series that will happen through the year. 
Uh, and, and to everyone who joined, I just want to say many thanks again. And just to remind you um, that the next episode of this series will be on the 18th of May. It'll be online on the 18th of May. Uh, so please register when, when the link comes out and share it with, with colleagues who, who may be interested in the topics that we'll be discussing. And of course, also just finally to remind you that the, the National Health Outcomes Conference will take place in person in the RCSI on the 25th of April. So again, that will, I'm sure, hold significant interest for many who, who've, who've joined us today. So again, thanks very much to everybody, and we look forward to seeing you all back in May for the next episode. Thank you. Thanks much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye now.